Hey, welcome to the TTSG podcast. I'm Lee, and in this episode, I'll be interviewing Marco Picota. Marco Picota is owner of the publishing studio Raybox Games. He's a game designer and developer with a career in the board game industry stretching right back to the 90s. He designed and co designed the games and supplements for Legions of Steel, Planet Storm, Inferno Battles of the Abyss, and Abyss the RPG. In 1997, Marco took a 25-year hiatus from the industry only to return with a unique Puffs Unknown system featured in its first release, Escape from Stalingrad Z, and its sequel, Escape from Project Reza. On the horizon, the Viking horror game Gates of Nilheim is poised to be released this coming November 2023, so we've got lots to look forward to from Marco and Raybox Games. The topic for this episode is solo play and AI mechanics, and as the Paths Are Known system is designed for solo, co-op and PvP, Marco's the perfect guest to give us some industry insights. So if you're a budding game creator or enjoy solo tabletop skirmish games, I hope you'll get some valuable information here. This is the first ever TTSG podcast and I've got some great guests lined up for the future. The podcast is going to be all about the tabletop gaming industry, so you can expect to hear from creators, sculptors, casters, narrative writers, rules writers, artists and many more. I'd love to hear your feedback in the comments so I can improve and make this a fun and informative new regular feature on the channel. I've been looking forward to this for a while, so let's get started and welcome our first ever guest, Marco Picota. Okay, hi Marco. Thanks so much for being the first guest on the TTSG podcast. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, excited to uh, find out what's going on and uh, what questions you have for me and whatnot. Awesome. So the theme of the day is going to be solo play. So let's get right into it. And the first question is, what do you think makes a good solo tabletop game? Well, I would say, I mean, it's almost like any game. What makes any game good, right? So you want it to be engaging. You want it uh, to, you know, uh, give you a challenge when you're trying to play it. And um, I, I think, you know, you want to be able to uh, take your time with the game. So the rules don't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to be like a quick game. I think that often when you play solo you know, you, you kind of want to like digest the game and have time to, to do it and stuff like that. Uh, but really, you know, just like any game, you want to have fun and fun is the, is the key. So you were telling me about your t-shirt earlier. So it sounds, and it oh. sounds like you've been playing games a while, but what inspired yeah. you to start creating your own solo tabletop games? Well, um, uh, I'll just mention the t-shirt that this is from Legions of Steel, which is a game I designed back in 91 with some friends, uh, and uh, it, at the time, it was inspired by Space Hulk. So, and all of you GW fans out there, I was inspired by GW. And um, but anyway, so what? So what happened with the solo stuff uh, was uh, uh, so I designed games from '91 to '97. Then I took a hiatus of 25 odd years, and then I decided to make games again. And uh, it happened. You know, I started designing before the pandemic, but then the pandemic happened. And uh, it was like, well, people are playing at home and a lot of people are playing solo. And I was like researching and looking on Facebook uh, groups, which there were many. And it looked like that it was a really uh, popular way to play a game. And from my perspective, um, I wanted to create something uh, that, uh, you know, if you don't have people around or you don't have time, you can do it. Uh, you can do it on your own. And so that's why that, that, that was what basically inspired me uh, to do solo. And then in the end, I decided to do World War II with zombies. So that was <laughs> it's a great combo. Yeah. Specifically, that, yeah, thematically, that's what I decided to go with. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. So here's something I'm particularly interested in. Hopefully, the listeners are as well. But during game design, what did you create first? Did you think about the player character? mechanics or did you look at doing the AI mechanics first and then how did they influence the design of each each other well that's a very good question uh, in my case uh, I 
ported over my le old like legions of steel system i had a system that you know we designed 25 odd years ago and uh it was a very good system and we had you know thousands of fans and there's still fans out there today even though it's out of print um so what i did is uh having that system already existing which is basically a tactical combat game uh you know which uses like a squad level so you're not you you know you don't need a ton of miniatures you can have eight eight people in your squad or whatever um and uh so I already had a basis, and then I modified it and upgraded it. I changed from a D6 to a D12, and I did a bunch of things. So for me, it started with your heroes or your characters. And then knowing what I wanted to do um, as to do a World War II game, so the game is Escape from Stalingrad Z. That's the one that was released already. And uh, knowing that I wanted to do it with – I was going to do World War II historical. And uh, – and then I just, I, I you know, I, I love horror and zombies and stuff like that. So it was like, man, why don't we do that? I mean, it has kind of like the best of both worlds. And I, I also felt that maybe I'll have a broader reach, you know, because not everyone's in historical. I love it. But, but you know, so, so then we, okay, so we're going to have zombies. So then it came to time. How do we make these zombies work? How do we develop an AI for zombies? And truthfully, like, you know, anyone can – zombies are easier to make an AI for than it would be to make it for an uh, actual, like, soldier that you might be fighting because AIs – for uh, sorry, zombies, you can basically choose however you want them to act and it won't be like they would never do this because they're, they're, oh, they're a zombie. So they'll do whatever we tell them to do, however we create the fiction, right? So, um, so then I developed the AI after for the zombies in the world and the interactions with stuff like that. And um, what I wanted to do, what happened was the rule system is a medium weight, medium heavyweight. So it's, it's, you know, it's very, it's pretty detailed and it's very tactical. It's like you really have to focus on what you're doing and it's difficult. Like it's not like an easy game to play, right? So there's dice involved. So sometimes there's randomness. Uh, but in the end, it really comes down to your tactics and it's very focused and you have to really concentrate on your on your team to see, you know, for survival. So I, I wanted, what that meant was I wanted the AI portion to be relatively simple. So I didn't want people having to spend a lot of time or like trying to figure out what the zombies would do. Um, uh, so I created a very simple system and, and honestly so simple that when people, when I tell people what the zombies do, they think that they're, well, that doesn't make the zombies powerful at all because we're playing on a grid system where the zombie moves one square. You can move up to eight squares, but the zombie only moves one square. So it's like, I'm going to get away. Like, how can, but <laughs> and the zombie, it, it has to first move beside you. Then the next turn, it, if you're still there, it'll lock you. So it kind of like grabs you like movie style. The next turn, it does a damage. So it takes basically three turns for it to do damage. So then people are like, well, that's never going to do damage. But they do. It's really hard. <laughs> so it's great. So it's really simple, but really deadly. Uh, so that influenced, like, what am I going to do? I'm going to make a simple system that, you know, the AI portion of it. And then what happened was it was simple, but I needed to create some more, uh, you know, interesting bits about it. So I, what then happened was I created different kinds of zombies. So you have a regular beta zombie, you have an armored zombie, you have like a kugelfish, which is an exploding zombie, then you have alpha zombies that are leader, like lieutenants, then you have like boss zombies, and there's three of those, you know, so then it was like, let's create a bit of diversity within them, and then some of them have special powers, and then, so that creates it still simple, but still cool, so that's kind of how it, how it evolved that way, and then beyond that, I just, you know, we're released Escape from Project Reason, which has more NPCs in it. So you're fighting Nazis and people like actual people. So we had to develop an interface for those AIs. And that was way more sophisticated. But we can talk about that another time. I guess. Sure. So what, what made you go from the D6 to D12? What was like some of the reasons behind changing the, the dice? Granularity. So the D6, you know, you D12 allows for more diverse uh, 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 events of things happening. So... It allowed me to uh, – going from a D6 to a D12. So a D12 allows for more things to happen. So going to a D12, what it really does in a practical term from gaming mechanics point of view is it allows me to create uh, – the, the net effect is I can create different weapons. So you can have more variety in weapons. When you have a D6, there's only so many things you can do with a D12. 
You can create a more variety of weapons, more variety of results when you're doing search tables, more variety, uh, more variety in like um, effects and stuff like that um, that might happen on the table. So that that was the primary reason, and uh, I did do D10 because I was already doing D6, so D12 was kind of like a good movement because it was twice, not exactly, but you know, closer to what what I think would be uh, simulated what I originally had. So did that help with like the narrative as well, giving you more options for narrative? No, I, I would I would say it does not help with narrative. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter. Narrative is up to you as a designer, as a writer, as a creator. That's, you know, uh, without going deep into it, you can do whatever you want in your creative process. So it doesn't matter what the system is, really. I mean, thematically it matters. Like if I'm doing a World War II zombies, then the narrative – it's got to, you know, kind of go that, that long, that toe that line. But uh, as far as the system is concerned, you know, uh, I don't think it directly uh, ne- it necessarily affects the narrative, uh, although you may find circumstances where it, it happens to happily kind of coexist or something like that. Just happy accidents. Yeah. Nice. Still going with the AI mechanics. How do you stop them being like boring, repetitive and predictable? Or is that even an issue? Well, I imagine it could be an issue, but thankfully, uh, it didn't turn out that way with, with what I, I was designing. Um, uh, I, I think what you need to do is give players a, a levels, like especially if there's any game designers out there listening to this, then there's some advice coming along. Um, and I'd be happy, you know, a future podcast if we do more and, and people are more want more focused on design elements, we can talk about all kinds of stuff. But so in our case... Uh, the game plays out on a uh, a book. So it, the book opens up and you play on one side of the book. That's your map. And on the left side is your uh, the instructions for the scenarios. So it's similar to a few games that they're not too many. Um, so what happens is the map is created. So uh, what helps with, with diversity, first of all, is the variety of AI characters or enemies you're going to meet. So there you've got, they do different things. They have different effects. So there's one thing. So you want to create a, 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 a pool of, of different things that way. And the other thing that um, you do is your maps. So your maps and the objectives that you have to achieve, maybe some secondary objectives, um, the terrain that you have to traverse, and the tactical things that you have to do to, you know, that all adds to creating uh, a variety within your within within what you're doing, and then you can also create variety by giving your characters. You know they can. Uh, it depends what type of game you want to play, but basically the way mine is, it's a narrative campaign. So your characters advance in levels. They get a little bit better. This they can change out weapons, and there's a variety of weapons. They consume supplies. Uh, you know you do searches where you don't know what you're going to get. So they're getting something good, or maybe just just app ammo so all those varieties uh all those things that you have to kind of like work on and and, and kind of like keep tally of is what's going to create a variety and of course the trick is not to make it so complicated so people feel like they're doing actual bookkeeping right and uh, the way we resolve that is a lot of what we have is on our uh, dashboard so you're not like writing so much down it's mostly everything is like pegs and, and stuff like that that's great. So when, when you design the map specifically, are you thinking about how that environment then is going to affect one, perhaps like a specific AI mechanic or a specific zombie character? And then that's why you would put that specific thing in a map? Yeah. So when you design the maps, like once you've created universe, so I have maps that are eight by 10 and your character plays it out and eventually it's escape from Stalingrad Z. So you got to get off the map because you're escaping. <laughs> uh, but there's other objectives in between, like, you know, you, that you need to do or things you can get. And, of course, there's clues to uncover and, sh- and stuff like that. Um, so uh, uh, at the beginning, and I'm trying to remember because it was a couple years ago, you know, you would look at the map and you'd create it and you'd kind of play it. And and you would try again and again. And, and, and eventually, for me anyways, became instinctual. So, yeah, we're creating – we want to make sure that there's enough space for the – for the characters to move enough challenges for them, you know? Um, and uh, so map design is very important, but I, the more and more you do it, the more it becomes natural to you as a designer. So it just kind of, kind of comes out well first time, you know? So I've got another question about like NPCs. So how important are random outcomes for them? 
Well, okay. So it depends what you define as an NPC. So an escape from Stalingrad Z, there is your your team, and then there's the uh, your enemy zombies. And there's a there's a few times that you encounter some Soviets and that sort of thing. Um, and um, uh, so NPCs are harder to create AI for because they react as humans. And how are you going to you know, make them act not stupid. <laughs> Why are they running away? I mean, I was just playing, uh, what was I just playing? Yeah, Blackstone Fortress, right? So Blackstone Fortress, uh, it has an AI card that has all of the stats of depending on what the situation is, it'll do certain things. So that that's that's pretty involved. Mine is much simpler than that. But, but, it, but that sort of graphic where they have like what, circumstances the NPC in and what they would do when you roll to determine that. That's a, a very effective way of doing it because it helps focus what the character or the NPC will do, right? But even with that, I had guys like they, they were just standing around way back in the, like my guys took the advantage because they didn't move. They just, I, I rolled a die that made it, they didn't move. So I'd be like, well, why wouldn't they move? I mean, in your mind, if you're creating a story, it could be any reason. Like there are things jammed, they're like they're trying to fix it. Who knows what that, why they're not moving. Oh, that's cool. So those little uh, little events could trigger just more like narrative in your imagination. Just to yeah, yeah, and that's the way you got to look at it when you're playing. So if if they did something that maybe is not, you know, there's so many things that can happen in the in the fog of war. Right, you're in the middle of combat, whether it jams, you literally drop a grenade. <laughs> like who knows what's going to happen? Because it's all it's all adrenaline pumping. You, you could die. <laughs> you know, there's a lot going on. Right. Um, uh, so, you know, I don't know how much that answered that question exactly. I don't know if... Uh, it's putting, like, the responsibilities on the player as well to bring the AI to life, really. Mm, I, I think, yeah, as a designer, you want to give the tools to the player to make sure that they can have an enjoyable time that seems, I, I, I guess you would call, realistic. If you're doing a war game and you have soldiers fighting, you want a certain amount of realism, Right. Um, but then when things don't go exactly right, maybe, or whatever, uh, you, yeah, you've got it. you kind of like, when you play the game, if you're playing with the story in mind, like, you know, then, then it, it, it's, um, I think it's more engaging and entertaining, but not everybody wants to play with a story, right? Like some people just, I just want to kill shit. <laughs> so, okay. Just play it straight up. Just, just like, you know, get in there and take out the zombies. Um, there's a story in ours, and uh, I, I think like Blackstone Fortress has a story. Many of those games that are solo play have stories or what narrative campaigns. What I like to call when I'm designing it is the player's journey, right? So, um, but yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you, you, you know, you're not. I think anytime you're playing, you got to be in a good mood to play and want to enjoy it, like come from a positive space positive standpoint and that goes for anything right if you're really critical of everything then you're not going to have fun right so sure i think we've kind of covered the next question was what considerations do you take into account when designing the narrative specifically for solo games do you think about it differently yeah well listen there's like uh to create a narrative to a game it's a story uh, so first of all, everyone loves stories. That's why we watch movies and read books. And even, you know, we want stories. We, everyone wants stories, unless you hate watching movies and reading books, then whatever. <laughs> Probably you hate a lot of other things too, like wine and the sunrise. <laughs> so anyways, but so we do, we all love stories. And some people have, a, 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 you know, a, want a more immersive story. And other people really just kind of want to hit the highlights and enjoy things. So what I did when I was designing is that I try to reach a happy medium. You have story elements. You have an intro into, into, into what's kind of happening, which you get with many games, right? And then there's clues to find and stuff like that. And then there's entries to read. So uh, I, I, it's not too heavy, but you still get a good story moving along. Kind of like every scenario you play is kind of like a scene from a movie. And I kind of like comparing it to a movie. It's about uh, something that's unfolding and revealing, right? Uh, so the idea for me is to create uh, a way that the story progresses from one scenario to another. Like maybe in some scenarios, nothing much happens. You're just trying to get you know, get some loot or find scavenge. But in general, you want to make sure you have progression. And what I specifically do is I create a matrix 
So it's literally a matrix where there's different habits. So the type of stories I design are choose your own adventure style. So there's not, it's not a direct line. You're not going to do this. You're not going to do this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. We actually create a matrix where your choices will, uh, basically when you play the game again and again, you'll, you can go down different paths and by doing so, to have a different story and have different outcomes and stuff like that. So I create a matrix when I do it. And this matrix will show kind of what, you know, if you go down this path, what stories are revealed. And it's literally a physical matrix, which like it's on Excel and everything. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. That'd make another podcast yeah. on its own, I guess. Yeah. Well, I can share some of my matrices in the future and stuff like that. If you want to see how I do it. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. Play testing is really important, right? So could you describe a little bit about your play testing process? For solo play games well because it's solo play i can play test it myself <laughs> that's good and then i give it to some friends or other people who are working on it to play test it so it means i don't need to have a, a it makes it easier because you don't need to get a group of people together that are agree to it and you can do it more often like i can um i'll be doing playing i'm going away to the later this week and i'll be doing play testing by the sea by the Mediterranean, I'll just like take out the maps, print them out and just play them. And I can play like if I was doing it like like full time, I can play easily five or six scenarios in a day. So I get to play test a lot. If there's a problem with a scenario, then you're going to kind of play it again and again and again. So um, uh, for solo play, it makes it easy that way. Um, but it's good to have the more obviously the more play, play testing, the better. So uh, and when you add narrative element to it it makes play testing harder because now you got to make sure that things work long term right not just on the one so if you're doing a board game that's just a straight up board game that you're playing solo there's one sort of play testing you can do there and refine it but if you're doing something that has more and more maps and scenarios and missions and stuff like that then you're gonna have to make sure they also connect well so there's a lot more involved albeit it's all solo and um something I've done now I'm starting to do is I release my rules. Like I'm starting to design the game. So there's two components to the rules. One is the learn to play. So you, it's got, it takes the first five or six scenarios, which you'll, you kind of read and you get the rules on a digestible amount of, so like five or six pages at a time, not like 40 pages or whatever. And, um, and since I create that and I release it, let for people to try out, it's, it can create a lot of play testers out there. Uh, who are willing to give feedback because you've just given them a free game in the first kind of like chapter of a, the first chapter of of the story of the game. And I've I've just releasing like um, I will be releasing a, a Viking version of our game called Gates of Nilheim, which is basically a Viking epic journey into hell. And um, that uses the same book system. It's called the Paths Unknown system, and it uses mostly the same rules, like 80, 90 percent of the rules. And I've just I made an announcement, so I'm giving a. I said, you know, I'm, I'll give a free. Anyone wants to play test it, they have to print it out because it's component driven. So you print out the maps. You don't have to print out the rules. You, you can just uh, just look at that on the, on your computer, and then you can use proxy miniatures or pieces or whatever. So you don't have to print out all. All you really need is to print out the maps. But what I've said to people is this: and if you play test the game, I'll give you a free. You can either get a game for free or you can get a free like special uh, 75 millimeter exclusive Viking hero miniature. You can choose between the two because I know everyone, not everyone wants the miniature. Like oh, I can't play with it. It's more of a model that's kind of like a, a showcase model. But uh, you know everyone wants a game. So some people will choose one. Some will do the other. But anyways, the, 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 so as far as playtesting is concerned, that went over like amazing uh, in the first – like 36 hours, I had about 100 people join. So, and there's still people joining. So, yeah, uh, later on, if anyone's interested, um, I'm sure Lee can put a link in there and you can check out the game. And if you want to become a play tester, you first, uh, of course, you get a credit as a play tester. So, you, you get a credit in, in, in the game itself. Um, but also a free game or, or exclusive miniature. So, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, I'll put a link down below. I'll bring up some images as well so everyone can have a look and see, what, yeah. see it too. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, good to get the game, and they get it early as well, I guess, would they? Or do they get it when it comes out? Well, they get they'll get the PDF version of the game basically early on, and they're literally influencing what's going to happen because their feedback's going to change. Up their playtesting, they're going, Marco, uh, what what's I don't know what to do with this, or this isn't explained enough, or something's missing, or you you know, like I, for example, uh, uh, in in the, the Viking thing, they're you're basically fighting Drog, which is a 
is kind of like a Viking zombie, okay? But it, it, it's 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 a mythical. So it, uh, on the map, it has a D every time, you, everywhere you got to put a drop. But when I was writing the rules, I put Zs for zombie just because in my mind. <laughs> so of course it says place a zombie on the, or not place a drug on the Zs, but there's no Zs. So it was so that's like something someone caught that it's very easy. So I just changed it or whatever. But yeah, yeah, it's really good. It's really important. Plus play testing. You know, hopefully if people like it, then they'll talk about it or they'll share it with their friends. And there's a lot more you can get out of it as well. Oh, and just one other thing, I'm I'm going to put up. Um, I've got this uh, uh, versus game called Z Zombie Tango Oscar Arena Battles 1. So I'm going to have those rules up soon. And it's kind of like Necromunda Zombie World War II. So anyone who wanted to play test that, I'll, um, those will be available in a little bit. Um, and anyone who play tests that game will get a free copy of, of Arena Battles. Oh, brilliant. So, yeah. And that's going to be like a multiplayer that's a multiplayer. So you build your 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 squad, your team. You buy your weapons. You get your hero in. You have a uh, you know a team control sheet with all the you know the stats and whatnot. It has like skill progression, um, and uh, uh, comes with maps and all kinds of stuff. So you can you can and it comes with a background universe and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So we, you'll be fighting against the other squads, and then zombies will come in too. Yeah, yeah. So basically, there's the zombie element. So they like fight anyone or will eat anyone. <laughs> so they're there and then you're fighting your two squads against each other. So you'll be fighting plus the zombies and then you might, you might, you know, some zombies might have zombie drops that you can get stuff from. You can play with whole teams. A really fun way, which we do at conventions now, is we everyone just gets one figure and you start with like a knife <laughs> and that's it, right? <laughs> and then, you know, somewhere else on the board is another person with a knife and whatever and 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 um, uh, those figures could have uh, some skills unlocked already, let's say. And, um, and ZTO is an expansion to Escape from Salgrad Z. So you kind of have to have the game first and then you, you have that. It's really f like fun because it's just you with your knife. And, you, and you know, uh, any zombie you kill in that game drops an ammo. So it's, you, you go and you stab a zombie. Hopefully you kill it. Then you pick up the ammo. You still don't got a gun, right? So you have to go find and hunt for guns and stuff. And, and then you have guns. And then your guy, other person picked up a better gun maybe or who knows what. So it's, it's even in this very simple just one-off you know, like like we could show up at a bunch of friends, be five or six of us, and just put a map out and just play it. And it's played all on a map on a grid system, so it's super easy, super simple to set up and that sort of thing. Yeah, that sounds great. That sounds really fun. How do you integrate storytelling and decision making into the solo games to make it more immersive? One way we did it um, was to do that choose your own adventure. So suddenly, you know. You've just, you know, you've just busted out of this ruined building where you've managed to escape the zombie horde and kill a bunch of them and, and salvage a PPSH submachine gun or something like that. All right. So then out you go. And then like, okay, now to your right, there's like, uh, you know, a decrepit building and you can hear moans of, of you know, the zombies that, that it's it, from that area. So there's like, feels like there's lots of zombies or you can go into the sewer. There's a sewer grate open, and you can escape into the sewer. So now, which way are you going to go? So you're like, I can go towards what appears to be zombies or into the sewer, and like, I don't know if I want to. So then your choice there will start making, like, you know, uh, will change the narrative form where it happens. If you go in the sewer, then you go off in a different direction. Is it worse? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> it's the sewer. <laughs> but if you play the game again and you didn't go to the sewer, you might go, fuck it, I'm going to go to the sewer. Uh, for sewer. Inside. <laughs> you might go, you might go, mm, I'm going to go into the sewer and just check out what, what I missed, right? So that's one sort of decision making, of course. Then other decision making you have is like, uh, uh, there's eight characters to choose from. So you can only have up to four at a, in your team. So you'll decide which, which are the characters that I want to play with. Do I want to bring the sniper, the medic? Do I want to bring the hand to hand guy with the axe? Do I want to bring, uh, you know, the, the assault trooper? You know, so you, you do those different choices. That's one way to do it. Um, and then, of course, every scenario comes, you know, with, you know, how you're, you know, which objectives are you want to achieve, which ones you're going to ignore. And, and there's like, you, you're like, oh, I really want to go get that, you know, secondary objective because I might get a clue or I might get, you know, extra ammo or a med kit or something, right? And then you're, you're deciding whether it's worth it or not, right? Because <laughs> the track, there's a round track that, you know, it's going down, going down. And every once in a while, the spawns, zombies are coming and then nothing to spawn, nothing to spawn. And then when it resets, 
you know, who knows what bad things are going to happen. So it's like, uh, do I want to like risk it? So there's choices like that to make. So you want to give your, 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 your players choices of where to go, you know, uh, who to choose to be in the battle um, and uh, things like which way you want to go once you're finished and then, you know, what direction you want to take with yourselves and stuff like that. Yeah. Next one is, have you got any thoughts on the future of solo games? Do you think it's going to get more popular? Is it growing? Is there any trends that you've picked up on? Yes. So definitely it's growing and definitely it's trending and definitely more and more companies are making their games soloable, right? So uh, I mean, there's been solo games for decades. You know, there's old, war, war, there's old war games that you could play solo. But more and more, you know, people are creating solo modes and seriously making it, not just like attack on, like, well, you know, they, they tell me if I make a solo mode, I'll sell 20% more. So now they're looking at it more seriously, so they create good solo modes. So that's happening. Everybody's doing it. Like, it's just basically almost everyone. If, you're, if they're creating a game now, I, I'd say more than half of the games are going to come out with a solo mode. So it's serious, serious stuff. And, um, and, and actually, me personally, I don't even buy a game anymore unless I got a solo mode. Like if I can't play it solo, like uh, maybe you can play it with more people. But if I can't play it solo as well, then I don't buy it. I live in Seville in Spain, and 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 it's the weather here is generally beautiful. Nobody wants to play games; <laughs> they want to be out and enjoy the world. <laughs> so you know, as opposed to like you know, Norway where it's freezing cold, you know, half of the year, and let's go inside and play a game. Uh, anyways, the thing is that I don't have as many players here, so to me, it's important to be able to play solo, and and I like. You know, even when I play computer games, I kind of want to just play by myself. I don't want anyone bothering me, right? I want to just be able to take the game out and put it down and enjoy it. And then um, without the stress maybe of other people or, uh, uh, you know, inter um, uh, I mean, I still like to interact. I still go out and have drinks and go, you know, but, but sometimes I don't want to. I just want to just focus and do something. So solo modes are growing. They're great. I think they're great. And we're going to see more and more of them. I've dedicated, like, uh, all the games that I'm going to release are solo. So, yeah. Well, uh, you solo co-op, you know, that sort of thing. Have you got any uh, – I mean, you've given loads of advice already, I think. But have you got any more advice or anything thing specific for aspiring game designers? Well, we could have sh six shows based on that alone. Uh, but I would say the most general way to talk about it – and uh, it, it's so true, even though it sounds, you know – uh, re, you know, a, a very reasonable thing to assume, but j just design the game, <laughs> like design it. So specifically what I would say, if you're aspiring, you're starting, design a game that fits on one sheet. One sheet, rules on one side, play surface on the other side, you know, one sheet, and then maybe it uses dice, of course, or little markers or whatever. But what happens when you do that is it focuses you to create something that's super tight, that makes sense, you use the right jargon to make it, you know, the people can understand it. You, everyone's going to read it for you, even like your wife or your girlfriend. <laughs> They'll read it because it's one page. <laughs> it's like, would you read this for me? And it's like a volume. It's like, yeah, I, I, I'm not reading that for you. <laughs> but a one page they will. And then they can play it like right after. It's because it's one page. So they can actually play it. They might be okay with it because the game at that stage will maybe be a five or 10 or 15 minute game. So like, Design a one-page game and go through the whole process, get graphics for it, lay it out, like how much, how difficult, you know, make it look as cool as possible. Find some free elements online, you know, background so they look nice and images that you can place on it. And just, and, you know, uh, really create it from top to bottom. If you've got markers, you know, create those, but really you want one page, so like use substitutes for that. So I know this is very specific advice. And and it and that is make a game, make it one page. I did that. Uh, I did it after actually. I was I just jumped into making big games, but um, there's a certain satisfaction to do it. So I made Kill Zombie, excuse me, Kill Zombie Kill, which is a one page game. Have you seen it? I haven't seen that. No. I'll give it to you. Like I mean, you can download it from the site. It's called Kill Zombie Kill, and it's it's basically one side is the rules, and then you flip it over. It's got a picture of a, a zombie. It's kind of World War II theme, and there's a luger at the bottom. Maybe you'll put you can put a picture up, maybe, and and basically you take dice. Each dice is a bullet. You and and you basically uh, you flick it. 
and you try to hit target recticles and, and, and stem the tide of the zombies that are moving down towards you, right? And if you get all the kills you need, then you win the game. And it's hard. Like, I, I, I played it for a long time and think I, thought I couldn't beat it, <laughs> but then I did eventually. But it, it's hard to play. And it's not, like, super intense. You're literally just flicking. You're, you're rolling a die. Uh, so, for example, in this game, it has several elements and it's one page. Uh, we, we can share it so people can take a look. And just create something like that. Super easy. But theme it how you want. You want to do Space Marines and get sued by GW for doing a one-page game? Do Space Marines and get sued by GW for doing a one-page game. You know, Or whatever. It could be fantasy. It could be... You know, it could be Viking themed, it could be Aztec themed, it could be cyberpunk, it could be whatever you want. But it, it, if you look at the one I did, you can kind of use this as an example of how to create something and make it unique. And so that, that's a very specific thing. And I would really encourage the new game designers to do that or really any game designer because it's challenging to do that. Uh, and then in a general sense, it, it really depends if you want to be a game designer uh, as a business or as a hobbyist, right? You can start as a hobbyist. So uh, it's if if you want other people to play your game and, and want it eventually to sell, right? Even if you're like, I think I want this to sell, you, but I, I'm not sure if I'll even ever get there. The idea you should, as a designer, create a Facebook page, create a website, or at least a landing where you can talk about your game. So you need to do that because you need people to start engaging with it and giving you ideas or you sharing your ideas. and And it takes... Uh, if you're doing it professionally, it can take a couple years. Like, give yourself the time to develop it. Like, you're not gonna. The one-page game, the one I did, I designed it in uh, four hours. <laughs> but if it's a big game, it's got lots of shit going on. Like, you know, it's gonna take a long, long time. But even now, if I do a game between me and Tom Frank, who I, Tom Frank's the guy I work with mostly. I work with other artists like Adam Dobbins and and people like that and Wes Johnson. Um, you know, it still takes about six months per game, and we already have the rules because we were so. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot to it, isn't it? Yeah, lot. yeah, that's another topic. So, are there any upcoming games you'd like our listeners to know about? Any sneak peeks or info you can give us? Sure, uh, absolutely. I'm working on games all the time. That's my life now. Is working on games. After I get off this call, I'll be working on games. Before I made this podcast, or we made this podcast, I was working on games. So. Uh, when I go to sleep at night, my brain is working on games. So good or bad, it's there. Uh, oh, so the games I'm working on, I've, I've just released, it's, it's, well, a few months ago, it shipped was Escape from Stalingrad. It's a World War II zombie solo game uh, set in Stalingrad, and you're trying to get out of Stalingrad, plus there's zombies. And then the sequel to that, which uh, successfully launched on Kickstarter, and it, it raised about 300%, and it's continuing to sell now as a, if you want to back it is Escape from Project Riza, which is the sequel to Escape from Project uh, Escape from Stalingrad Z. So that's the way I'm doing my games is their sequel. So Escape from Project Riza is like six months later. Think of it as a movie, right? And instead of being in Stalingrad, it's like in the Owl Mountains, which is in southern Poland, which is now southern Poland. It was Germany at the time. And it's an underground complex. And it's kind of like, you know... Uh, uh, Kaffel Wolfenstein ish, but you're underground and there's Nazis and there's zombies and all kinds of stuff. And you've got your team and your insertion team and you go in. So there's that. And you can use characters from the previous game. You can just bring them on right on over because we're going to create templates for all of the original characters. That's, so you have like 16, 18 characters to choose from. So that's the second game in that series. That will continue to go. There's, we're already working on uh, superficially the next one, which is, is, is Africa Corpse 41. So this, the next one is actually a prequel to the first two. So it's like a movie. It's totally like movies, right? So it's like, it's like 1941. So Stalingrad's 42. Riza is 43. And this is 41. So it goes to what happened. It's in North Africa. And it's got all kind of the LD, LRDG, which are long-range desert rats and stuff like that. You know, long-range... Uh, uh, the desert group um you know there might be sas elements and stuff from the british and then you have africa corps africa corps uh germans and then you have of course it's in north africa which is egypt so all kinds of stuff when they get trapped in the tomb together so and they basically have to collaborate to win so that's like the third one and then the fourth one we're working on as well so that's a whole series and then we got some going on in the pacific so that's a whole series of games called the zto series, the uh, Zombie Tango Oscar. 
Uh, so that, that's what's in that uh, realm of games that are being made. There's also an expansion for it called, like I said before, the Arena Battles, where you can do versus play. Um, and then I have this Viking game. So it uses the same system. It's kind of a, it's obviously fantasy based now. And it's uh, Vikings and Christians fighting together against a greater evil, which is going to, you know, take over the world like a movie <laughs> and that one is in playtest stage so that we're we're playtesting it now we're writing the rules a lot of the rules have ported over from the other game with modifications and um that you can find on game found as well and it, it, it's it's in the preliminary stages so you can just join to uh you know kind of get updates and stuff like that um or if you want to play test it, then you can just download the rules and be a play tester. Or you don't have to play test. You can just download the rules and check it out and read it over and play it. But you don't have to have the obligation of play testing. The rules are free. You can just play them the way they are um, with no obligation. But if you want to be more involved, you can as well. Oh, that's really good. So I'll put links to all this down below. So we'll have like all the notes from yeah down there. So that's great. Cool. So let's wrap this up then. So where can where can people find you? Where's the best place for them to go? Well, you'll uh, well. You can go check out what we're doing on on our website, which is so it's Raybox Games is is, is my company, and www.raybox.com. Super easy. Uh, you can find us on BGG. The board game group has a whole bunch of stuff. People are making comments there and doing stuff. Of course, we have our Facebook groups. We have Instagram. We have all like the slew of what everybody has. If you're gonna kind of have to have to make things work. Um, if you're going to be a company trying to trying to do that, and uh, actually, I look forward to some future podcasts. If you have uh, questions from people, that's the one thing I should have added. Does anyone have any questions uh, regarding solo play or just game design in general? And maybe through those questions, we can develop new podcasts that address those and give people answers, or at least the answers that we feel are the right ones. And you're a game designer too, so don't forget you can, you can say <laughs> yeah, stuff as well. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's brilliant. No, that's a great idea. Yeah, it'd be awesome to get some questions from everybody wouldn't it yeah let's get some questions out there and 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 i think so and then we can talk about those in future podcasts love it that sounds great well thanks marco this was really interesting i really enjoyed this it was great to get a little insight i think there's so much you could you could give us but i think we've got a lot here in just this first podcast so thanks so much it was really great and um i think you've just created an awesome system and the games are really exciting and now with the vikings and zombie combo I think that's just fantastic. So, yeah, thanks so much. This has been really good. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And, uh, you know, I look forward to doing some more cool stuff. So, good. Thank you so much for listening to the TTSG podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And as always, I'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback. So add your comments down below or drop me an email to lee, that's L-E-E, -E, at tabletopskirmishgames.com. Let's end with a quote from Siddhartha, a novel by Hermann Hesse. It's only when the mind is free from the habit of distraction that it can concentrate on some single beautiful thing and dwell upon it in undistracted meditation. Solitude, when we are weary of our fellows, is where we find our true selves and become acquainted with the voiceless, formless and unknown reality within us. Thanks again, and I hope you'll join me for the next TTSG podcast.